You can see that what I've done here is I've just kind of tidied up what we informally did uh, earlier on this morning and just said, okay, this weird thing here, what is it? Okay, well, when you see that, that weird symbol, it's called the integral sign, okay? The integral sign means, as the letter suggests, you're adding up a bunch of things. You're taking a sum. That's why it's literally a stretched out S, okay? The sum is going to be a bunch of rectangles, and those rectangles have this height and this width, okay? This height and this width. And you remember how we constructed that in the earlier example with the rocket, okay? However, the difference between this and um, our old friend sigma notation is that sigma notation treats everything in nice big integer blocks, right? It's like there's the one and then the two and then the three. Whereas the integral notation actually borrows an idea from calculus, taking the limit as this dx business goes towards zero. Do you remember that when we were doing first principles, right? We would say the limit as, now we would say h approaches zero, right? Do you remember that? But h, what was h? It was the tiny little run. Do you remember that? It's the, it's the, there's rise over run. So you could write it like this, right? As that approaches zero, and what you had up here was x plus that. There's your rise. And then on the bottom, you've got your run, okay? Now, this idea from first principles of differentiation, it shouldn't be that much of a surprise that we borrow it and we use it inside here as well. So if you want to think about it this way, the integral notation is kind of like sigma notation, except you divide up your object into, well, have a look at this diagram, right, because I'm about to destroy it. Instead of thinking it as nice, neat rectangles, right, what you have is an infinite set of infinitesimally thin rectangles, each of which has its own independent height, and each of which has its own infinitesimally thin width. Okay? Now, if you just thought about one of those such rectangles, it would have no area because it's infinitesimally thin. But if you added up an infinite number of them, just like when we add up you know, uh, one of these things. Uh, whoops. Oh, yeah, no, that's right. right. When you add up an infinite series, like a geometric progression, okay, you actually get something at the end. We're doing something very, very similar here, which is in fact the main reason why we did series of sequences before we did this. It's to gear your mind up for adding up a whole bunch of infinite things where those things tend toward really, really small things, but they still add up to something. Okay? So, the first important thing I want to emphasize here, which I didn't talk about this morning because we've just been overloaded, is how much you can see the letter x. Can you see the pretty rule x there? It's very important. It comes up a lot of times. In fact, it's so important I want to highlight it for you because it both matters and doesn't matter. Let me explain that in a second. Okay? So let's have a look at it. I see it once, twice, three times, four times, whoops, five times. Okay? So the x's appear many, many times. Let me explain firstly the way in which in some ways, it doesn't matter what, those, what the x is, okay? The letter x is what we call a dummy variable. That's a weird phrase, but that's actually a technical term. It's called a dummy variable, okay? Now, I was talking to Russell about this in the morning because he asked the question related to it. Those of you who've ever played or seen played the game of football, right? Touch football, you know, that kind of thing, or rugby league or whatever. You guys know that when someone gets the ball, okay, uh, there's nothing roughly ball-shaped here. That's, okay, whatever. Someone gets the ball, okay? And then they get tackled, okay? And then what do they have to do? Well, they have to take the ball, they put it on the ground, and then they pass it to someone directly behind them, okay? Now, that person is called the dummy half, right? Now, what's their job? Well, once they get the ball, okay? So the person behind us just put it down, they pick it up. The immediate thing they do is they get rid of the ball. They pass it to someone else, right? So they don't hold on to it long term. They're kind of like a little placeholder. It's like just for a second they have it and then they quickly get rid of it. And that's what happens with this. Go back to your earlier examples. Do you remember? The first line you would have would have this in it and then immediately on the next line all the x's are gone because they've been replaced by numbers, right? You evaluated the definite integral, okay? So it's a dummy variable which means I could just as easily have written, for example, a, B, F of Y, DY, okay? If this is the same function, right? If say F of X was, I don't know, 
some completely randomly selected function, okay? Then f of y would be the same thing, just with y's instead of x's. And so when you put some numbers into this, you, you'll get the same thing out, right? The results will be the same. So this thing here and this thing here are identical. They will both eventually equal some number. I'm just going to call it k. All right? So the number has nothing to do with x or y. The number is 8 or 23 or 5 pi. Okay? And it doesn't care whether it came from a y or whether it came from an x. Okay? So that's the first thing to note. It's called a dummy variable because in a real sense it doesn't matter. When you're evaluating it, you will just get a number at the end. It doesn't matter where you started. But it kind of does matter. Because watch what happens now if I actually do go through wrong color and replace all the x's with y's. Because you'll notice if you have a look at my formal definition, and if you haven't written it down, do, do write it down. Watch what happens if I do actually change it with respect to the whole definition. Watch. If I go f of y dy, then I go, well, that's not an x anymore. That's a, that's a y. That's not x equals a. It's y equals a. And this is not x equals b. It's y equals b. When you think about the integral as an area, like this thing here, it actually is something different now. Here's another different function. I just drew something to be convenient, right? If this is f of x, then when I do this integral, it's going to be up here now. Do you see this? Look, it's against the y-axis. That's over here, right? It's between y equals a and y equals b. A, B. So now I've got a whole different shape altogether. It's an area in a whole different place. Okay, does that make sense? So the variable, it sort of matters, but it sort of doesn't, depending on how you're actually using it. Okay? If you're like, oh, I'm in a question, I don't know which one is which, then just ask me and I'll help you. Okay? Now, speaking of which is which, I want you to remember that this guy here, whoops, is adding up a whole bunch of infinitesimally thin rectangles and you end up with, geometrically, what do you end up with? You end up with an area, don't you? Okay. So being that this is an area, you can think of it in two different ways. You can evaluate it two different ways. You can actually just find the area, like look at the shape. It's a, it's a square, it's a rectangle, it's a semicircle, whatever. Okay. If that's easier, then go for it. No calculus required. All this means it's, is it's the area. So find the area, whatever's the easiest way. Okay? But sometimes, such as the two examples I have on the board, um, I don't even know what this shape is called. I don't even know if this shape has a name, let alone what it's called. So you don't have a formula for this, the area of a wiggly thing. Okay? You don't have a formula for it. So therefore, you can't just go to the area as if it were a normal plane figure. You have to treat it as something that you have to do calculus to. So you're going to have to find the primitive, put those boxes around, and do that. Um, so something like this, oops, from A to B, okay? Now, I'm going to push on this for a second. How do you tell which one you use? Just like in calculus when you were differentiating, trying to find the nature of a stationary point, how did you choose whether you use the first derivative or the second derivative? You looked at which one was easier, but how did you know which one was easier? If I gave you a random function, if I gave you a random function like this, and I said, off you go, determine, find the stationary points, determine their nature. Which one would you use for this one? I, I hope we would mostly use the second derivative here, right? Because differentiating once gives you 2x plus 5. Differentiating again just gives you 2. Differentiating again is really easy, no problems. Whereas if I said, for instance, this, like, oh, no, nah, forget that. Okay, I don't want to differentiate that again. The more times you differentiate it, the worse it just rapidly unravels, okay? So that's how you choose. So you look at the function and you make a judgment. Well, it's the same deal here, right? You must look at this function and you have to make a judgment, right? Is, is it an easy shape? Do you, do you end up with a recognizable triangle, trapezium, parallelogram, something like that? Then, then just do that. If it's not, then you're going to have to, like, for example, in these cases, right, you're going to have to go through the primitive. Does that make sense? 